Awesome. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Amanda from the Urban Ecology Center in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, and today on Backyard Naturalist, we're going to be talking about cryptic coloration, or better known as, as camouflage. Before we get into it, just wanted to say, as always, thank you to our subscribers. Um, and give a little reminder that uh, this season we will be taking several subscriber appreciation trips. Um, the next one being to Cudahy Woods on November 5th. Um, that's a Saturday in the afternoon. Uh, you can sign up at our website, urbanecologycenter.org, and this is free for subscribers, um, but open to anyone who wants to join. We'll also be taking a trip, a longer trip, um, at the end of November, November 30th to December 2nd, um, to the Indiana Dunes and Jasper, Jasper Pulaski Fish and Wildlife Area um, to see the crane, Sand Hill Crane um, stopover at, on their migration. Um, more details on this will, will come soon, um, but if you are interested, you can go ahead and email Tim his email is there on the screen. But today, like I said, we'll be talking about cryptic coloration. And I think of it as kind of like a fun I spy book. This is one of my favorite books as a kid, um, especially around now because it's Halloween time. Um, but I'll, I'll have a lot of opportunities for us to be seeking out um, mostly animals, unlike this book where you can find things like pine cones and clothespins and lots of other fun things. So we'll start out with one of, one of these little games. This is a camera trap picture from, I don't remember exactly where, um, but somewhere in, in uh, New Mexico, I believe. And very clearly you can see this giant elk but there's also a mountain lion in this picture. So take, take a moment and, and take a look. It's very difficult to spot um, because of its coloration. Blends in really well, and this is this is something that was shared. I can't remember exactly when, in like June of 2020, it went viral on Twitter. Um, there are lots of news stories covering it. And people um, very surprised, wanting to know the fate of the elk, which unfortunately we don't know. But if you're looking closely, you can spot the mountain lion off on the right hand side. Kind of next to this tree. If you still can't see it, zoom in a little bit, and there it is. See, it's a really well matched to its background, which is luckily true for most mountain lions. They are ambush predators, so they will stalk their prey, um, get as close as they can, and then go in and make a kill. You don't know the fate of this elk but one, one can only assume. So what, so what is cryptic coloration? Cryptic coloration, um, better known as camouflage, is a strategy used to avoid detection or observation by making an individual difficult to see. There's a lot of different ways that this can be done, um, but why do it in the first place? It is both, it has both evolved as a predation strategy and a pre anti-predator adaptation. So as with a lot of things, there's kind of like this evolutionary arms race um, between predator and prey, where they're constantly trying to evolve to better match their background in cases like these, where you have like a bobcat and a rabbit. So they can be more inconspicuous on the part of the predator, 
um, and the prey, um, essentially to either be more successful in in that predation event or more successful in avoiding predation. The forms of, of cryptic coloration that I'm going to be talking about today are these, these five, um, which are color matching, disruptive coloration, seasonal variation, counter shading, and then active camouflage. There are much more forms uh, of ways that individuals camouflage or, or use crypsis, um, whether it's, it's either behavioral or physical. Uh, behavioral can include stuff like self-decoration, like hermit crabs will often do this, um, or even being in a group versus solitary. Um, physical things like mimicry, which is a whole another topic that we could spend a whole backyard naturalist on um, that has to deal with very specific, um, not only coloration, but, but structures of the body as well as behavior. Um, so I won't cover that today, but that is another form of crypsis. Starting with color matching, this is just having similar colors to the environment. Um, so like this grasshopper here, very green to match some of the grasses that it lives in. This is probably the most common tactic and it's fairly simple. Um, here's another little, little I spy for you. There is a rabbit in this picture, um, but it essentially, is just matching the color of your fur, your feathers, your exoskeleton, your scales, whatever, to the background. Um, it's usually just a single color, um, which makes it fairly simple, um, but also makes it very common. Um, and it works best as a protective measure rather than something like a predation strategy. So take a minute. It's definitely hard to see the rabbit. I didn't see it when I first came across this picture. But <clears throat> if you look very closely, it's right in the center. And if you still can't see it, there it is. So the fur on this rabbit blends really well with the, um, the rock in this picture, uh, making it really great especially if your prey, you don't you try not to move around as much. Um, as you can probably tell, it's very difficult to see. Um, the next form of cryptic coloration that I'll talk about is disruptive coloration. Um, this is one of like the most interesting cryptic coloration forms to me at least, um, but it's essentially using high contrast coloration to break up outlines. And so it's very similar to um, just color matching, but in this case, it uses patterns and shapes to kind of break up the outline of the animal, um, making it work really well in a variety of backgrounds. So like in this picture, there's a snow leopard in there, but probably very hard to see because of the patterns and coloration of a snow leopard's fur. Um, it blends in really well in these high mountain areas um, and works well whether it's winter or summer. Um, it's often combined with other forms of crypsis like that, that color matching um, or some of the other forms we'll talk about in a bit. But if you haven't spotted the snow leopard yet, again, it's right in the middle. You can kind of barely see it. You can see these rosettes um, on the snow leopard work really well to break up that outline of the animal. Which brings us to 
my first video, which will talk more about the patterning on snow leopards and how that works um, really well as camouflage for them. So here we are. Snow leopards are most active at dawn and dusk. They are extremely secretive and hard to spot because of their wonderful camouflage. Their color is broken up with gray to black rosettes on their bodies, with spots on their heads, limbs, and tails. This coloration pattern lends itself to a perfect camouflage amongst the rocky outcrops and snow-laden mountainsides. It's not unusual for a snow leopard to drag its kill to safety before feeding eating all edible parts. A snow leopard can survive on a single kill of a large animal for two weeks. In the warmer months, when the snow and ice have melted and the forests at the foot of the mountains spring to life, the snow leopard easily relocates and hunts among the foliage and shrubs. Thanks to the patterns and color of its fur, the leopard remains beautifully camouflaged, blending in with the speckled shadows cast by leaves and branches, while its fur is hard to distinguish in the bright light. All right, so as, we, as you saw in the video, even though the snow leopard is for the most part white, it's still that this disruptive coloration that it has um, still lends itself really well to it transitioning between winter and summer because um, of that, that shadowing the video was talking about. Don't play again, I just always do this. The opposite of, of disruptive coloration is warning coloration, which you might be a lot more familiar with. Um, this is essentially an advertisement of the presence of an animal um, using patterns and colors that emphasize rather than disrupt their outlines. Um, so a lot of, I wouldn't say it's most common in prey species, but a lot of species that are more vulnerable to predation use this tactic to essentially say, hey, you don't want to eat me. Um, I taste really bad. I might kill you. Um, so by advertising this, um, because they have different, different strategies that they use, like the monarch, um, because it eats milkweed, is poisonous. Um, same with like poison dart frogs. Um, it's essentially advertising you don't want to eat me, so it doesn't have to make as much of an effort in trying to remain cryptic. Next is seasonal variation. So this involves having coloration that varies between seasons, usually between summer and winter. So this is essentially color matching, but will change between seasons. Um, it's also called snow camouflage because in, for the most part, um, animals that employ the seasonal variation form of, of cryptic coloration change from a brown or like a mottled color in, in the summer to stark white to blend in with the snow better. So. Here are our friends. You can see very, very white, blends in really, really well. And even in the summer months, um, this modeling and this, this color pattern blend in really well with the grass. Then we have counter shading, um, which is essentially using high contrast to break up outlines, pretty much the same as, as disruptive coloration but it's very specific in that 
you have dark toning above and light below. So like this is very common in marine animals um, so that if you're underneath them and looking up, they have this lighter, lighter underside that blends in really well with the bright light from up above versus if you're looking down on them, it kind of blends into like the dark water beneath. Um, but terrestrial animals also use this, um, mostly Thayer counter shading, um, which is like this graded toning um, rather than like this, this stark difference like you see in the penguin. Um, so that when you're looking at it from more of a side view, it flattens the animal. Um, so like with the, these um, goats, you could see that the top is a darker color, their legs are a lighter color as well as their belly, but looking at it, at it straight on, it essentially flattens that shape of the animal so you can't see the outline of it as well. Like with, with disruptive coloration, there is a reverse. We have reverse counter shading, which again is warning coloration, um, where you have light, a light top, but dark underneath, maximizing your contrast to really say, here I am, you don't want to mess with me. This is very common in the most, most prominent example are skunks and badgers. Um, for both, particularly with skunks, you have this, this warning coloration because they will spray you and it smells bad. Um, but they also have sharp te teeth and claws, as with badgers. Badgers are essentially warning you. Um, they don't sting as much. They won't spray you like a skunk, but they do smell. Um, but they're saying like, I have really sharp teeth and claws and you don't want to mess with me. Um, which brings us to our last form, which is active camouflage. Um, this was another really interesting one and is not very common. This is changing coloration rapidly to resemble the background while moving. Um, and this is most common in cephalopods, so squid, uh, octopi, and uh, cuttlefish. And what's really interesting about these species is that they have specific cells in their bodies that perform this active camouflage for them. And it's not only changing the coloration to better match their background, it's changing the texture of their skin. Um, so one of these cell types are chromatophores and these will translocate pigment and reorientate um, essentially to reflect light. So essentially what's happening is the pigment within this octopus is being moved around so that it appears in some places more white to kind of blend in with the sandy bottom, um, but still having those, those dark spots um, to kind of mimic rocks um, and such. The other cell form is iridophores, which are super common, particularly in squid. Um, and you can actually see them moving when you have like a live squid with you. But these are chromatophores that reflect light. Um, and so they're generating iridescent colors. And so with squid particularly in combination with like, it's not so much in com combination because they're pretty much one color throughout, but this is giving them the ability to counter shade because they're using their these chromatophores to reflect the light and kind of mimic like shimmering water essentially. It's super, super cool. And I have some more info about octopi. Watching this clip of an octopus, you can see just how quickly and drastically it can change colors. 
In slow motion reverse, you see the color change spread across its body. The 3D texture of the skin also changes to match the surrounding seaweed and coral. In the blink of an eye, it has almost completely blended in with its surroundings. Cephalopod camouflage is among the most dynamic in the animal kingdom and relies on a system of extremely sophisticated tissues. Chromatophores are organs that are speckled across the skin of the octopus, like freckles. They contain tiny pigment-filled sacs, like little balloons full of different colored dye, which can be black, red, or yellow. The pigment sacs are surrounded by radial muscles, which can stretch the sac to reveal the pigment's color. Just like balloons full of dye, when stretched, their pigment color appears bright and vibrant. Depending on which sets of sacs an octopus opens or closes, it can produce patterns such as bands, stripes, or spots, helping to turn itself into a rock, a coral, or a kelp in an instant. But if the octopus needs to produce colors outside of black, red, and yellow, it uses another layer of reflective structures in their skin called iridophores. They are stacks of very thin cells that lay beneath the chromatophores. They contain a protein called reflectin that bounces certain wavelengths of light back out. They are responsible for the metallic blues and greens that appear to shimmer on the skin of the octopus. Beneath that layer is yet another layer of reflective tissue called lucifers. These reflect ambient light, usually producing white hues. By combining reflection from the iridophores and lucifers with the correct patterning of the chromatophores, the octopus can create a very convincing copy of its surroundings. But the octopus has one more trick up its sleeve, allowing it to disappear in plain sight almost completely. Using a structure called papillae, it can change the texture of its skin, creating ridges and bumps that rise and fall. This helps the octopus match its surroundings even better. With all these tools, the shell-free, soft-bodied octopus has been able to deceive an ocean full of predators for millions of years. But their survival has not hinged on these camouflage properties alone. It's the way they're controlled that is perhaps an even more compelling survival tool. When an octopus travels along the sea floor, they have to assess the background and modify their camouflage constantly. They are making decisions at a rapid pace. One researcher observed an octopus changing its camouflage 177 times in one hour. Octopuses' camouflage reaction times are faster than any other animals, up to 200 milliseconds, as fast as the fastest blink you can do. But despite doing so much with color, the octopus and almost all cephalopods are surprisingly thought to be colorblind. How can they match colors they can't even see? In 2015, the answer to this question started to be uncovered. Researchers found that the skin of an octopus is sensitive to light due to photoreceptor genes active in the skin. Even when the skin was detached from the body, it could respond to light and change the shape of its chromatophores. Scientists realized that an octopus can see with not just its eyes, but also its skin. But as the octopus body was evolving its color-changing defense mechanisms when it lost its shell 140 million years ago, another transformation occurred, the development of its large brain and nervous system. The photoreceptor genes in the skin work in connection with the octopus's large and complex brain. The octopus can change color so fast because the octopus controls its chromatophores neurally. Other animals that can change color, like chameleons, for example, take much longer because their color change is hormonally controlled. Hormones take time to get into the blood and distribute around the body. A color change can take over 20 seconds when controlled this way. Some researchers believe that color change in the octopus may be like breathing or blinking for us, something it can choose to do, but also something that can happen involuntarily. It can have awareness from its eyes and brain, but also throughout its body. So oh, that's, this is a really cool video. It's much, much longer. I'll send it to Tim to include in his, his Thursday email, but it goes into how intelligent they are, how they can like manipulate their body to fit into different spaces. But, Super cool. Um, 
cephalopods and, and octopi in particular are kind of the only animals that employ this kind of complex active camouflage. Other animals, like I was saying, that um, that you know change ch change color like chameleons, um, employ it hormonally rather than neurally, and so it's less of a a form of camouflage and more a form of communication for them. Um, so super cool. No, stop yes. playing. That's that's actually it. This whole series is actually super cool. But anyway, that's all I have for camouflage. And I can take questions. Who has any?